Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Nancy Wilson's talk on communication from our audio collection titled Women in Marriage. So today is principles of communication in marriage. And as I said, I hope those of you who are not married, it's not just about filing it away for later, although that's important, but also just to be applying it. Now, the Bible has so much to say about words and speaking and communicating. I was thinking, I hope I can communicate about communication <laughs> well for you today. Think about a day without words. You know, words are part of so much of our lives, if not all of it, because language is something, a wonderful gift God bestowed on us. So it's a strange thing to think about it. When we aren't speaking, we're thinking. We're thinking in words. We're reading words. We're writing words. God speaks to us in his word, and he speaks to us through creation, and he speaks to us in our hearts. And we speak to him, we speak to one another, and we speak to our own hearts. We speak to ourselves. So we want to speak rightly. We want to speak in a purposeful way. We want to speak in a good way and to think about how we're doing this. In other words, it's very central. And it's very central to our relationships, of course, isn't it? Earlier today, I had a business call with someone in another state. And it was funny because on the email exchange, she was very friendly and courteous. But on the phone, I felt sort of in trouble you know, with her. <laughs> and I was a customer and trying to be chipper. But it's funny how words, and, and it's not just the technical words, is it? It's the tone of voice. There's a lot to it. So I felt sort of chastened when I hung up. I, I think I'll just email you in the future. <laughs> but at any rate, it's very central to our relationships. And our tongues, as you know, are dangerous things. James says, chapter 3, Verse 5, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. Verse 9, therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Verse 10, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Okay, so in other words, this is wrong. This is haywire. This is not the way we want it. So, some very important things in these verses, and they're very good for us to think about our tongues regularly. Not just once every so often, but frequently. Last week we talked about the wife's relation to her husband in terms of submission and reverence and obedience and a significant means of showing obedience and respectfulness is by way of our mouths. I mean it's the way we talk to our husbands, the way we talk about them. And wives are notorious, right? Notorious for bad-mouthing their husbands. It's universal. Whether it is in small groups, or on Facebook, or on their blog, or perhaps, or reality TV, or any, you know other websites devoted to the whole topic, it's universal. I've talked with women before who perhaps were in a, a group for mothers of twins. Uh, another one who was in a group for wives of law students or, you know, just all kinds of women's groups. And these Christian ladies told me they dropped out because all that was happening week after week was the women coming together and just complaining, mostly about their husbands and how they weren't filling their needs, that sort of topic. You've seen it. You've heard it. It's, it's everywhere. And this is what the tabloids are full of, Right. I'd never open one, but there it is on the cover when you're in the checkout stand. I mean, you know, it's just universal. So we talked last week about how submission has to come from the heart. It can't be something you crank out in the flesh. It's by grace. It's a work of the Spirit in your heart, and it has to come from the heart. It can't just be an external grit your teeth and submit, because that is really a pretense. It's not the real thing. So if we submit to the Lord first, 
get our hearts right before him, then we can submit from the heart cheerfully to our husband. And the same thing is true when it comes to communication. It has to be from the heart. It has to be by the grace of God. It has to be a work of the Spirit in order for us not to have this tongue that is a fire where we're blessing God but we're cursing men and where our mouths are just back and forth. All this filth coming from them and uh, destructiveness from our mouths. Obviously we have to get this grace from God. One of the first things I noticed right after my conversion in college was a change in my thinking and just the words that would come to mind right off the bat. I remember shortly after my conversion I was at work and I shut the drawer on my finger or something and I thought, oh, I didn't even think a bad word. You know, like, I, I have really been washed on the inside and it's showing up on the outside. And it was so encouraging to see that because it wasn't me thinking, okay, now I'm Christian. I have to say nice words. You know, as God does this work in our hearts, so it always gets back to that. It always gets back to God enabling us, God forgiving us, God washing us, God making it happen. So, as we go through these principles and some rules I'm going to sprinkle in here about communication, just always please bear that in mind, that it has to be from the inside out. 1 Timothy 4.13 is describing the young widows, and they were known as a class, as a group, because he's not just pointing out one or two of them. It's just the group of young widows are known to be idle, wandering from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Okay, Gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. So they had this trait as a group of being gossips and busybodies. And again, how often young women with not enough to do can fall into that, or older women with not enough to do can fall into that. And we might not have to physically go house to house now. We can get on the phone, we can text, we can email, we can Facebook. We, can, we have all these tools to make it easy to be gossips and busybodies. Okay? So all the more reason to be paying attention to this topic. How many broken relationships were brought about as a result of words? Of course, words and actions get all tied up together, but how many hurt feelings have come from words? How many churches have been blown apart by words? And so often, sad to say, the women had a big part of it, big part of it, just spreading things around and the resulting hurt feelings and that kind of thing. So very important that we pay attention to our words and we realize how powerful they are for good or ill. And the evil influences are sometimes easier to see than the good, but they have potential for great good. But we just see when all the devastation happens. But there's lots of good that can happen as a result of our words. I'm going to be quoting a lot of Proverbs today, but not nearly all that is there. One time I went through Proverbs just looking for every verse on the tongue. And there are mountains of them. And so I didn't bring all of them today. <laughs> I commend the book to you. But I have quite a few of them here that I'll be referring to. Proverbs describes women in particular, the disrespectful, brawling wife, as a continual dripping, as one of the terrible tragedies of a man's life. Isn't that a sad way to think of it? One of the terrible tragedies of a man's life. Charles Bridges did this commentary on Proverbs that I've really enjoyed and profited from. And one of the things he points out that a wife who is complaining and brawling or quarreling and disrespectful is a terrific affliction for a husband. And I'll have some more quotes from him as we go along. So rather than being the kind of wife we want to be here. She is a tragedy, a terrible tragedy. So obviously that's not what we're shooting for. We want to be communicating love, respect, courtesy, and submission to our husbands. And remember, I mentioned this last week, respect is not about your husband. It's about you. It's not a command to your husband to be respectable, although he should be. And it's not a command to him to make sure you respect him. It's not about him. It's about you. Are you being respectful? Okay. 
So respect is about you, not about him. And women tend to say, well, I can't be respectful because he... Okay. But the command is to you and it's not conditional. It's just like children, honor your parents. It doesn't say if they fill in the blank. So the command is to us. So we want our language, our words, to be positive, to be building up, not tearing down. Proverbs 14.1 The wise woman is building something. She's building her house. The foolish woman is tearing something down. And it says with her own hands. And I think really it's probably a lot with her tongue. So the wise woman builds her house. The foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. You have probably heard women say things about their husbands, about their parents, about their children that really surprise you, that are destructive. And you can almost hear the two by fours splitting, you know, as they go off on their husbands. And it's a way of tearing down the house. And it becomes more and more public as it goes on. And you see the destruction, especially after years of this. A wise woman, on the other hand, is speaking highly of her husband. I just decided early on, one of the first Bible studies I went to as a married woman, I was so surprised because all the women were complaining about their husbands. And I remember being really quiet and thinking, you know, I got a good one. So I just not, I don't have anything to say. You know, I just felt like this is a weird, I got in the wrong group. And um, then I realized, oh no, this is, this is just, this is the way it is. And that's when I just started thinking, there's something wrong with this picture. This isn't the way it should be. So I decided, I remember thinking, you know, I want people to think more highly of my husband, not like, oh, there's that bum that did the stupid thing last week. You know, because that's what would happen is you'd hear a wife say this, and then I'd see it, this man, this poor man, and i think, oh, you're, phew, you know. <laughs> um, that was awful that you did that. But the unfortunate thing is I never got to hear his side of it. You know, what brought that on, and what was she doing? And that's the nature of the case. So I just remember deciding if I'm going to speak about my husband or my kids, I'm not going to make up lies about them and say all my kids got 4.0s, or if they didn't, or brag in a self-centered, foolish way. But it's just that if I'm going to speak about them, that people would think better of them, not worse. Because there's no reason, is there, to hang out the dirty laundry for everybody? Now, of course, there are always exceptions where you must bring up things. Abigail is in the Bible for a good reason for us. She was married to Nabal, and he was a stupid man, a foolish man. He was a fool. So, of course, if your husband does something stupid, you don't have to pretend he didn't. But if he repents, then you should be there to forgive him and stick with him. And if he doesn't repent, that doesn't mean you shouldn't stick with him either. It's going to be tougher. But with her, she was loyal in the right order. She had her loyalty straight. Okay? First, she was loyal to God and then to the truth, and then to her husband, in that order. And she stuck with her husband until it was impossible to do so anymore. And that's when she intervened and, and went to David. I hope you know this story, and said my husband's a fool. Uh, she had hung on for a good long time. And so when the time was right, then she chose the right side, when it became a very clear issue. And so, of course, if your husband does something publicly foolish, if he repents, you're going to stick with him and you're going to forgive him. You may feel like you got a dent in your armor for a while, but loyalty can help put things right. You just stick with him. And if you have to go get help, go talk to the right people. I encourage wives, go talk to your pastor, talk to an elder, get help. Call the cops if you need to call the cops. Don't think that respect is absolute when it comes to your husband or your parents. If, you're, if your father is you know, doing something that is beyond just uh, not letting you go to the party you wanted to go to, <laughs> not in that category, if he's actually hit you or he's, you know, there's a category of things, immorality, theft, all kinds of things where you need help, where you need to get pastoral help. So that's when you don't just pretend like that didn't happen. But you talk to the right people who can really help and provide accountability. Even Abigail, her speech is respectful. 
she's not going off on her husband. She's saying, my husband's a fool. And as a result, the whole place was going to be leveled. David was going to come in and slaughter everybody. She intervened at the right moment, and God blessed her for that. He blessed her. So there are times when a daughter or a wife needs help, and so by all means, get help and get it in a respectful way. It is not antithetical in any way to respect to go to the elders and say, my husband has a porn problem, I need help. Or there's some other woman my husband's seen, I need help. Or my husband hit me or hit one of the kids, I need help. I mean, send up a flare, get some help. That is not being disrespectful at all. I'm going to go over a few things here, the purpose of communication, the manner of communication, and the attitude, and I'm just going to sprinkle in some little rules as we go, suggested rules that will help you. First of all, the purpose. Well, the purpose of communication is edification, that building. Remember, it's to build up. Whoever it is, even if it's at the checkout line in the grocery store, you can say something that will build up, or you can say something that will tear down. And we can even communicate without words in such a way that's building up or tearing down. So the purpose is edification. Now, generally speaking, and this is going to come up when I get to differences between men and women in that last talk, but as a general rule, women have a greater need, desire for communication than men do. Okay? There are exceptions to that, but as a general rule, women are chattier. Do I have an amen out there? <laughs> now, remember, if our need is greater and we need to talk, we have to remember that we should be guided not by our need, but by our husband's need, if we're going to be giving to him. All right? We want to be guided by his need, not ours. That doesn't mean that you don't talk or that you no longer have a need to talk, but it means that you want your talk to be purposeful and edifying and not just chatter, just a lot of chatter, not a lot of filler and rambling and so forth. He may not have the same need to hear you as you have to, to speak. And if he is a loving husband, you know, he will. He will listen. He will sit there and listen for hours on end, probably. But be kind to him. And don't put him through the ringer on this. If you love him. <laughs> Sometimes maybe you should save some of the chattiness for the girlfriends. Go for coffee and chat. Be chatty as long as it's guided again by edification. But there will be plenty of things you need your husband's counsel and input and feedback on. And of course you want to get it. But you want to govern that with wisdom. So you may need to tell him all about your day. Especially some of you young moms. You're home with the kids all day. You haven't talked to an adult maybe. You need to talk to him about a bunch of stuff. And so when he gets home, you're loaded for bear. I mean... He'll be in any moment, and you're going to just unload the whole truckload of hay on one horse, they say, or whatever. <laughs> and so he's gearing up on the, on the way home like, ah. <laughs> so I'm just saying, give him some breathing time. Give him a little breathing space before you just go into it. Look for the right moment. You may need to tell him all about your day, but then when you say, how was your day, what's he say? Fine. It's like... Is that it? Well, he doesn't have the same need to go over the whole day that you do. He really doesn't. Now, again, there may be exceptions. I've met a few exceptions, so I know they're out there. But fine to him really did communicate his day. It was fine. No complaints. Right? And you feel personally offended because he did not give you the blow-by-blow -blow account of the day. That's a setup for trouble right there. So I just encourage you, first off, to know about that. Heads up and consider the man that you've married and when does he like to talk? If my husband has been talking all day long, and often he has been, he really would love to just have a little downtime. That is a bonus for him. It doesn't mean he doesn't like me at all. It just means his brain is tired and he just needs a little breathing space. When the kids were little, I can remember saying, okay, now, when, you're, when your father gets home, like, let's do this. You, you know, and just helping sort of, because they are all full of news and questions and things. And so I would put it in kind of a file in my mind for dinner. Okay, and you can ask about that at dinner, and you can bring that up and, and take a number 
and we're going to get through it all. But when he comes home, let's just give him a few minutes, you know, and let him unwind for a minute. And then at dinner, and he gave them plenty of time to do that. And sometimes our dinner times, when they got a little older, would go on and on and on because they were full of questions and comments about everything. So they got plenty of time with him on that. So just consider your need to communicate and consider his need for regrouping and for listening. And then I tried to just skim the cream off. I don't need to talk to him about that. I already know the answer to that. He doesn't need to know all that. I could say, these are the big things I do need to talk to him about. Besides just the general conversation back and forth, but the real things that needed to be addressed, I needed input on. I learned that I could get by without a lot of some of the stuff that was unnecessary. We could do without. Don't just talk to talk. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. That's Proverbs 10:19. The mouth of fools feeds on foolishness, but the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. Okay, you see this positive, constructive result of good words. And foolishness, when it's coming from the mouth of fools, and there's sinfulness if there's too much talking. This is one of the reasons I was not the big fan of the slumber party. It's not like I think it's a sin in itself, but generally, put a bunch of little girls together for an all-nighter. They stay up too late, they eat weird food, (laughs) and they say things they shouldn't, and it's not edifying. Years ago, I did a ladies' conference back east, and Doug and the kids were with me. And the first night, I spoke on something or other, I don't know what. And then in the morning, all the ladies stayed in the hotel, and there were a bunch of them. And then we were in this little cabin. And then in the morning, I went in, and I started in on respect and talking about your husband and talking to your husband. And I could tell everybody was just looking worse and worse and beat up and just sick. And I paused and was like, "Uh uh-oh, I know what happened last night. They were off at a ladies' retreat, staying up too late and eating weird food. <laughs> and, and they shared way too much. They just overshared. So after that talk, they all were going around, sorry, you know, and making, putting things right. And I learned, do, first night is when you give that talk, <laughs> before, not later. But our daughters... We need to protect them in that. And you college girls, you probably don't do slumber parties, but you do very late night study groups. And you know what I'm talking about, where you just become careless and speak carelessly and say things that you have to put right the next day. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. All right, so make sure your communication's edifying, that this is good. This is building people up. It's not tearing people down. Would your husband be pleased if he heard it? If he heard you saying that? Or your parents? Would they be so blessed to hear what you had to say? I've used this example many times, but years ago when I was teaching at Logos, there was a family with many children at the school, and the father was killed in a very freak accident. And um, all the kids could remember was all the wonderful things that all those children had said about their dad. I could remember it. I was teaching a couple of them, and it's like they were known to be saying things like, my dad is so cool. He does, fill in the blank. They were always just talking about what a wonderful guy he was. And then the one time I had had a conversation with him, he was telling me how wonderful his boys were. So isn't that funny? And so when he died so suddenly, and I did not know him other than just a very short one conversation I did know him because of all the things his kids had said about him what a great guy he was what a loss so children you know just be aware of that kind of thing what have you said about your parents what do people think about them based on what you've said or your husband or your children whatever the manner and the content should be characterized by kindness and courtesy Proverbs 31 that passage on the woman she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness it is a law but it's a law of kindness like a mother laying down the law to her kids but it's a kind law it's it's good it's kind and remember you can only bring out what's in your heart it's all that you can get out of there 
you think, well, I didn't mean to say that, or I didn't, you know, that's not really who I am. Well, the only stuff that can come out is what's inside. That's all that is physically possible to come out is what's in there. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. So if you hear yourself say something and you go, ugh, you know, that tells you what's on the inside. So you can't just fix the words. You have to fix the heart. So be careful about teasing. I mean, if it's genuine teasing and you know it's going to be well received and it's going to be taken kindly, then go for it. But if it's a disguise for real criticism, then don't. Don't do it. Fix your heart. If you're trying to get something out that is, and the teasing is just a camouflage, you know, don't do it. Don't say it. Talk at convenient times. That's being kind again. I mentioned that. Timing when you're going to talk to your husband, when you're going to bring things up. Talk about things that interest him. How about that? Instead of maybe about your knitting. I mean, you know, he might like that. <laughs> but talk about things he's interested in. That doesn't mean if he's a chemical engineer, you've got to know all about that. I'm not saying that. But he has other interests. So allow him to transition from work. Make it easy on him. And then a few suggestions on communication when you're resolving problems. And these are some rules that actually Doug and I implemented right after we were married. Uh, one was don't work out conflicts late at night. Do not. And this goes for your roommate, too. I mean, it's unwise. Okay, the longer you talk, the worse it gets. And if you call it quits, say, you know what, we need to fix this in the morning. Let's just apologize and work out the details in the morning. It's amazing what the light of day does, doesn't it? It puts things in a totally different perspective. I think this also goes for things you tell yourself late at night. You get in bed, oh, I'm a terrible mother, I'm a bad wife, and I have no friends, and I'm fat and ugly, and nobody likes me, and <laughs> on and on. It's like, you know, just turn that off. Because, or worry at night, ah, this is bad, things going to happen. In the morning, it looks so different. I think we have an enemy who knows this is the time. You're tired. It's a bad time to resolve problems internal or external. So turn it off. Just turn that off. The beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Stop it. Just call it quits. We have, I think, a 10 o'clock rule. And it was like, you know, this, whatever the problem is, it in the morning will finish working this out. But let's not talk about it now, especially if I was pregnant. <laughs> you know, you do tend to have a more emotional the times when you're pregnant. I don't know, or monthly or whatever. But... Just remember, you're just a creature. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you have a headache. I don't know. But be careful. Be careful. And stop yourself. And say, let's regroup. And even bringing it up in the first place. Timing is important. I would say, pray over this for a few days or weeks, depending on what it is. Ask God to show you if it really needs to be brought up. Because sometimes as you pray about something and you say, Lord, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the problem. Show me how I can f fix this myself or what I can do differently. Sometimes after a few days of praying about it, you think, I don't need to bring that up. I don't at all need to bring that up. Love can cover that one. No problem. So don't bring things up impulsively or bring things up because you are ticked or because you are whatever, out of fellowship about something. Get it right in your own heart first. Pray for the timing to bring something up and then bring it up in a respectful way. And you may even want to say, honey, there's something I'd like to talk to you about later. When would be a good time? Okay? Instead of springing it on him. Because sometimes when we spring things on one another, we immediately go to our defenses, right? We're not disposed to listen. So rather than jumping on him with your list of grievances or whatever, pray over it. Ask for a good time when you can talk, and then bring it up respectfully, carefully. One of the other rules we had is no past forgiven sins may be brought up. Did we forgive that? Then it is no longer on the table. So you can't bring up old stuff. Hatred stirs up strife. Love covers all sins. Okay? 
that's Proverbs 10, 12. Love covers all sins. If you don't have enough love to cover it, well, then you do need to bring it up and get it fixed. Okay, and there are plenty of things like that, that you do need to bring something up. But you don't need to bring it up with a hateful spirit or an accusative spirit, but with a humble spirit. Don't accuse Never say never or always. Those two words are absolutes. You never fill in the blank, take out the trash, or you never call me during the day, or you never, or you always say, I'm too tired. You know, not once. He hasn't done it right even one time. <laughs> not once. So those two words are not allowed. You can say, well, occasionally, or sometimes, or yesterday, whatever, but not always. It's an accusative spirit that, that uses those. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and it is to his glory to overlook a transgression. That's a great verse. That's Proverbs 19.11. If you're discreet, you're very slow to get angry. You can take a lot of hits, you know, figuratively speaking. You can wipe up the mess many times. And it's your glory to overlook a transgression. Not a fault, but a real sin. It's your glory to just overlook it. Just overlook it. And unkindness, just overlook it. Um, we tend, women tend to attribute motives. Well, he said that or he did that because, and you fill in the blank because he doesn't like me. Um, one time, years and years ago, a lady called me, and she said, I'm leaving my husband. I am leaving today. I said, what happened? It's like, he leaves his socks on the floor always. And I'm not making this up. But what had happened was, those socks had become huge, huge mountains in her marriage. She had imputed so much meaning into those socks. And so much motive into him dropping him there. You know, she had asked him and told him to not do that over and over and over and over and over. And he still did it. So she'd had it. You know, and so I talked her down off the roof. <laughs> and she did not leave him. But the thing was, she wasn't overlooking a transgression. And she was just imputing so much into those socks. He hates me. Every time he leaves the socks, he hates me. It's like, you know... I'm pretty sure that's not what the message he was intending to send. He was being careless or thoughtless or whatever. I'm not saying he was, he shouldn't have picked up his socks. I don't know. I never talked to him. But I have a feeling she was being that kind of wife that was not easy to be with. So think about that a little bit. Think about it before you bring something up. Are you overlooking things? Are you imputing motives? Are you putting a lot of meaning into little things that may not be there at all. So get the grace to get the glory. Overlook it. Get some glory. Now, the other thing women do, is your husband picks up a vibe. It's a little chilly in here. It's a little chilly. What's the matter? And what do wives say? Nothing. Nothing. Is something wrong? No. Nothing's wrong. <laughs> Well, first of all, that's not true. So you need to be truthful. And you need to say, yes, something is wrong. I don't know what it is. Or everything is wrong. <laughs> or, you, you know, but you can't say nothing. And then he says, oh, good, Whew, thought there was something wrong. And when he wanders off and you think, hey, you know. <laughs> so you have to be truthful. And of course, we need to get things right so there isn't anything wrong. And so you can truthfully say, no, nothing's wrong. Sorry, was I sending out signals? My bad. Sorry about that. Or actually, yes, something is wrong. I need to talk to you. Or, you know, but be, be honest about it and say, yes, I'm in deep sin. I have a bad attitude. And I should probably go to my room for a minute. <laughs> Seriously, you know, I'll be right back. And give me a minute. You know, but don't say nothing when it is everything you mean to say or something. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Don't be too emotional. That's Proverbs 29, 11. A fool just vents all his feelings. just lets it all hang out. It's just everything. Here it is. And that's when it's foolish because some of those feelings 
should never have been spoken. They should have been repented of and not ever spoken. It's very hard to bring the words back, isn't it, after they're out. A wise man holds them back. A wise man has some of those feelings also, but he's holding them back. He's going to deal with them in a more gracious manner than just spewing them all over everybody, right? So have a motivation of kindness as you communicate. Because, you know, you have to work out problems. You want your home to be running on all cylinders, and there will be bumps and little things that come up, and you need to talk about them and be honest about them without stacking the deck emotionally or using these always and never and staying up too late and talking about them and so forth. All right. The attitude we should have when we communicate is humility. A teachable spirit. Be teachable. Listen. Listen to his side of it. There is another side to the story. He is looking at all this with two different eyes, completely different eyes than yours. He sees this differently. So be a good, eager listener. You say, yeah, but he doesn't talk. So how can I listen? Well, I understand that's a challenge. But you can ask good questions. You can be willing to wait. Let him know you're willing to wait, but you would like to hear from him on this and some men clam up because as soon as they start they meet with resistance and it takes a backbone to stand up and say would you be quiet and let me finish what I'm saying you know because then a husband can double think himself and think well maybe I'm being selfish maybe I'm you know but it takes a man with backbone to tell a wife to pipe down for a minute so number one don't make your husband have to do that but be a good listener and pay attention to what he's saying to you or to the kids or whatever. When he differs with you, be willing to be instructed. Say, I would like to have that viewpoint too. Can you get me there? Can you help me get on that page? I don't see it, but I want to see it. Take what he says very seriously. Don't dismiss him or patronize him. I know more than you do about it, or ignore him, or become chilly, it's one of our little manipulative things we can do, or be stubborn, digging in your heels, or argumentative, or critical, or scolding, or disputatious, or quarrelsome, or comparing or insisting on your own way, or belittling his views. Okay, that was a lot. Those are all things not to do. Be willing to be won over. He who refuses correction goes astray. It's Proverbs 10.17. The wise in heart will receive commands. That's 10.8. So, a lot of men clam up because when they start to talk, they get shut down. Or they get a lot of back chat. And they just, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. So, make it worth his while. Make it worth his while so that when he tells you what he thinks, he has a very interested audience, somebody that really wants to implement what he's saying, who wants to hear him, who cares about what he thinks, who respects what he thinks, who admires him. Going back to Bridges, he says, A teachable, correctable spirit is the best proof of a wise heart. I really like that. If you are teachable and correctable, you're wise. If as soon as your husband starts to speak to you or your parents, you become defensive and you're not going to hear it, and instead of listening, you're rushing to think of all your whole case of arguing, you know, you're not wise. You want a teachable spirit. That means, that means SOS, prayer. Okay, Lord, if something's coming, please give me a teachable, correctable spirit. And you never know where it's going to come from. It could come from your husband. It could come from your parents. They need to talk to you. Many times I prayed that prayer. It wasn't any kind of correction at all. But I was like, okay, here's something that's coming. <laughs> Give me just teachable heart. Just whatever they say. And then they don't say anything correcting me at all. It's like, whew. But other times something comes and we weren't prepared, right? And so we automatically get defensive. And that's when we have to say, no, no, just listen and receive it. Receive it and don't react to it. All right. 
Your husband should know he's going to meet with a good listener, a teachable spirit, a tame spirit, that gentle, quiet spirit. You know, a quieted animal is one that's tame, approachable. Like a horse that's been broken that you can walk right up to, doesn't run off. You want to be that approachable and not bristling as soon as he has something to say. Just think about it for a moment from his perspective as the head of the house, how he's supposed to steer this group. And you are the one that's going to implement so much of what he wants to happen. And if he's thinking, oh, brother, you know, how am I going to, how am I ever going to get this to happen? You know, it's just going to be an uphill battle. Like I said, a lot of men just think it's not worth it. I'd rather just have the status quo. Everybody's happy and I don't have to deal with a bunch of trouble. So a woman who's teachable welcomes teaching. She puts a high value on discipline and discernment. She's cautious, weighing her words. She's sensible. Don't ask for your husband's input unless you're really willing to hear what he has to say. You know, one time Doug and I were having a conversation and I said, give me one of my, and we weren't having any conflict, we were just in a conversation. I said, give me one thing that you know is a blind spot that I just don't see. I would love it. Just give me one. And so he thought about it for a minute and he thought of one. It was a silly thing, but it was something I really had never known that I did. And I was like, wow, that's easy to fix. That's simple. And thanks for telling me that. Thank you. That's great. But I, it was truly a blind spot that I never noticed that I did this little quirky thing. And what a blessing to get that. So, but don't ask for it if you're not willing to hear it, you know, because some of your husbands, you know, may be waiting for that moment when you're going to ask and have a whole list of things ready to give you. <laughs> so don't ask unless you really want to know what it is. And it wasn't anything that annoyed my husband, but it was just something that was funny that I could fix quite easily. So at any rate, but be willing to hear the hard stuff and give him opportunities to tell you when you're up to it. Say, honey, you know, I've been thinking about this. and But don't ask it lightly and don't put him on the spot. But be willing for his input. Make a point with all these things, all these things, to speak grateful words every day. Make it a point, a habit, to speak grateful words, encouraging words every day to the people who hear you and listen to how often your words are not being thankful but are complaining about things. Just listen in and ask God. You can always ask God also to show you your blind spots. Your husband's not the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying instead of the Holy Spirit, ask your husband to show you. Oh no, you know, he, he can't see your heart but uh, he can see a lot. Make a point, even if it is just, it seems really by rote, where you're making a little note to yourself and checking it off, you know, until you get in the habit of being thankful and not complaining. Look for ways to express positive things, edifying things to your family. So many women have grown up in a critical atmosphere. They're so beat up on the inside because they've always been criticized, generally by their mother. And so if you have a mother who was positive and kind to you, thank God and thank her for that. But many daughters grow up where they just hear so much criticism constantly that they just are pretty beat up by that. And it shows. They're needy, needy people. They're looking for approval somewhere because they can't get it at home. Or their fathers pick on them always pointing out their flaws and their shortcomings and whatnot. So I'm not bringing that up so you can all then go, yeah. Because you may need to forgive them for all of that. We know what it's like to be on the receiving end of unkind words. But when we are speaking those kinds of words, our unkind words ourselves, we're always thinking in terms of our motive. Well, but I had a good motive. I had a good reason to say that. But it was unkind. So we excuse ourselves because we think we had good motives, but we don't excuse other people when they're doing it to us because it hurts our feelings. I hope that makes sense to you. So rather than imputing motives to other people, you know, we should be thinking about the impact our words have. And then I just say, mothers, 
take every opportunity to be building up your children with encouraging words. Good job. Way to go. I'm so proud of you. Wonderful. And your husbands. Good job. Wonderful. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you for working so hard. Thank you for coming home every night. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for providing for the family. Thank you for this. So many things to express gratitude for and daughters to your parents for many things. And if your mind can quickly go to all those unkind things, then ask God to help you just forgive, overlook a transgression. It's to your glory to do that. And what's happened is those destructive words have destroyed you. You know, you've got some places in your spirit that are pretty beat up and you say, well, God, you can restore. You can rebuild. We can patch this up. And he can, of course. The spirit does that in us. So let your communication be a well of life. It's feeding many. And then finally, a verse to close with that I hope you can maybe think about this week. This is from Psalm 141, verses 2 through 4. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. It's a great prayer to pray when your husband's coming home or you're sitting, you know, any time you're just to say, Lord, set a watch like a little the guy with the sword at the door right here by my mouth <laughs> and say, nope, nope, that one won't come out. Yeah, you know, yes, that one's fine. Come on through. You know, so just ask the Lord to keep that door. And then put anything right that needs to be put right as far as careless words. I don't know how many times I've gone home from some event or other and realized I've spoken out of turn and had to call someone and say, please forgive me, I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have, whatever. Put it right, put it right. And I can remember starting to pray this when I'd go into those situations. Just set a watch, Lord, I don't want to make any phone calls when I get home tonight. <laughs> Sorry, I said, you know, just keep, keep alert, pay attention. And then when you speak disrespectfully to your husband, make it right, right away, immediately. And, and that's going to be the subject of next week, keeping short accounts, but put it right. That was out of line. That was disrespectful. Please forgive me. That was unkind. Please forgive me. Take care of it. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was a message from our audio collection titled Women in Marriage. If you'd like to hear the rest of the talks, you can purchase them at canonpress.com audio.